In London's storied past, few threads are as colourful as the saga of brotherhood that wove itself into the very bricks and mortar of this ancient city. Here, we see pairs of brothers, not just bound by blood, but by an unquenchable ambition to imprint their legacy on London's skyline. This is not just a tale of familial bonds, it is a chronicle of audacity, where the dreams and schemes of siblings transform the fog-laden streets of the capital into a playground of their aspirations. From the whispering galleries of power to the echoing halls of commerce, these brothers didn't just make their mark, they bought, built and breathed life into the London we stroll through today. Sibling rivalries amongst brothers have always captivated the general public with the kind of drama and intrigue usually reserved for Shakespearean plays. Consider the legendary 12th century feud between King Henry II's sons, Richard the Lionheart and King John, a brotherly feud that held the very English throne in the balance. Or the Barclay brothers, those famed British business moguls whose corporate clashes and courtroom skirmishes could easily fuel a modern-day soap opera. To even in more recent years, where we all remember Oasis's Gallagher brothers flipping a sibling rivalry into a public spectacle, all the while turning their squabbles as iconic as their actual songs. But what happens when this classic tale of sibling rivalry isn't fought between brothers themselves, but a heated competition over billions between two entirely different families? Indeed, that is precisely the spectacle unfolding in 21st century London, as our capital's real estate crown has become the ultimate spoils in a prize fight between two sets of brothers, the Reuben brothers and the Livingstone brothers. Now in the right corner, donning the gloves of seasoned strategists, stand the Reuben brothers. With a flair for high-profile acquisitions and a portfolio that's a veritable atlas of prime real estate, they're akin to heavyweight champions in the ring of property development. Their moves are calculated and their investments diverse, spanning from luxury retail to opulent hotels. Now, cast your eyes to the left corner, where the Livingston brothers are gearing up. These maestros of the metropolitan landscape boast a knack for transformative projects, turning underutilized spaces into thriving urban hubs. Their approach, a blend of innovation and intuition, making them formidable contenders in this urban duel. Today, as the bell rings, London watches with bated breath as the city's skyline becomes the arena for this titanic clash. This isn't just a fight for property, it's a battle for legacy, influence, and the right to shape one of the world's most iconic cities. In this episode, we'll give you the final scorecard and let you make your own decision, as we describe. The dueling billionaire brothers who own London's prime real estate. In the high-stakes monopoly game of London real estate, the Reuben brothers, David and Simon, are already the equivalent of owning Park Place, and they're fast on the heels of the Livingstons to snap up the boardwalk spot as well. These tycoons, who rank among the UK's wealthiest families, have turned London's skyline into a veritable Christmas stocking shelf of their assets, with a Santa's gift bag share in the elite enclaves of Mayfair and St. James. And for those not in the know, Mayfair and St. James are to London what Rodeo Drive is to Beverly Hills, a blend of historical charm and wallet-thinning opulence. Owning property here opens doors to an exclusive network and lifestyle, enhancing the social and business opportunities for the owners. And investing in real estate in Mayfair and St. James not only assures a prestigious address, but also offers a resilient value proposition. Now, the Rubin Brothers portfolio is a collection of London's most valuable and sought-after properties, each a unique gem in the city's architectural crown. Consider the Millbank Tower, standing majestically along the Thames River. This skyscraper is a celebrated icon of London's post-war development and modernity, and its prime location and sweeping city views make it an enviable spot for businesses and political offices, symbolising progress and strength in the London skyline. And Oxford Street, with its pulsating energy and endless stream of shoppers and visitors, houses the famous London Primark store, another arrow in the Rubens real estate quiver. This location is not just a retail space, it's a cultural epicentre where fashion trends from around the world converge. Additionally, Carlton House in SW1 is another highlight, reflecting London's historic charm and elegance. Situated in one of the city's most exclusive areas, it embodies the sophistication and allure that is characteristic of London. But then there's their pièce de résistance, the Piccadilly Estate. 
This collection includes the famed In and Out Club at 94 Piccadilly and the Burlington Arcade, a Grade II listed shopping haven sold for a mere £300 million in 2018. 94 Piccadilly, formerly known as Cambridge House, holds a prominent place in the city's architectural and social history. It was once the home of Lord Palmerston, former British Prime Minister, and the Inn and Out Club, so named for the prominent traffic signs at its entrance, has become synonymous with luxury, exclusivity, and a deep connection to British heritage. Furthermore, in the heart of luxury retail, their 5152 New Bond Street property, home to the Armani flagship store, stands as an icon of their pension for high-end investments. But their empire isn't confined to these trophy assets. It sprawls across Grosvenor Street, Bruton Street and others, areas renowned for their blend of commercial might and cultural heritage. Admiralty Arch, part of this collection, further epitomizes their flair for blending historical significance with modern luxury. And while the exact valuation of their London empire is as elusive as the Holy Grail, their estimated net worth of £25 billion in 2023 gives a hint of its magnitude. But to be clear, this wealth isn't just anchored in the UK. It spans the Atlantic, with significant stakes in New York and South Florida. Thus, to describe the Rubin brothers' portfolio merely as impressive would be like calling the Sistine Chapel a nice ceiling job. With that all said, let's dive into a little bit of the personal history of these princes of prime central London. David, born in 1941, and Simon, born in 1944, are the sons of David Sassoon, Reuben, and Nancy Reuben, and are ethnically part of a Baghdadi Jewish family. Their father's journey from Iraq to Bombay in search of better prospects in the textile industry laid the groundwork for what would become a remarkable business saga, and the plot thickened when the family dynamics shifted, leading to the brothers' relocation to London with their mother in the 1950s. But the change was not without its challenges. The brothers found themselves adapting to a new life in Islington, North London, and navigating the British educational system, with Simon leaving formal education prematurely and the brothers' foray into the business world was characterized by modest beginnings, David in scrap metals and Simon in the carpet industry. But it was in the property market that they found their true calling, a sector that would later define their business empire. Their strategic foresight was evident early on, as they were among the first Western investors to capitalize on the shift towards capitalism in Russia. Their venture, Trans World Group, rapidly ascended to become a leading force in the global metal industry, commanding a significant portion of Russia's aluminium production. By the turn of the millennium, the Rubin brothers had shifted their focus back to the UK, divesting their Russian interests. Their portfolio expanded to encompass real estate, venture capital and private equity, with a particular emphasis on the UK property market. Later, a notable chapter in their story unfolded in April 2020 with the proposed acquisition of Newcastle United Football Club. The Rubin brothers, alongside Amanda Staveley's PCP Capital Partners and the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, initially faced resistance from the Premier League. However, by October 2021, the Premier League sanctioned the buyout, with the Saudi Public Investment Fund acquiring a majority stake and the Rubin brothers securing a portion of the shares. However, not all their endeavours sailed smoothly. In 2006, Ken Livingstone, then Mayor of London, vociferously criticised the Rubens' involvement in the Olympic City development, urging them, in a controversial statement, to try their luck with the Ayatollahs, referencing their history in the Middle East. Despite Livingstone's fiery remarks, an official investigation later dismissed complaints against him, labelling his criticism as robust but reasonable. Through these various ventures and challenges, the Rubin brothers' journey from the streets of Bombay to the forefront of London's property market speaks to their business acumen and adaptability in the ever-evolving world of global investments. However, as previously mentioned, the Rubens are not the only brotherly barons of prime central London. Their ostensible main competitors of the Livingston family boast an equally impressive roster of real estate holdings and property investments. Indeed, in the dynamic and ever-evolving world of London real estate, few names shine as brightly as those of Ian and Richard Livingstone. The driving force behind London and regional properties have constructed an impressive real estate kingdom, with their assets in the UK capital and beyond valued at a staggering £5 billion, with each property sparkling with its own unique allure. 
Take, for instance, Leveson's vintage clothing in Shoreditch, a beacon of style in one of London's most avant-garde neighbourhoods. A nod to the cultural zeitgeist of an area celebrated for its eclectic and trend-setting ambience, this property demonstrates the Livingston's keen eye for snapping up our capital's hotspots aimed towards the youth. Then there's the dazzling array of top-tier hotels. The London Hilton on Park Lane and the Trafalgar St. James stand as jewels in the crown of London's hospitality scene. These aren't mere accommodations, they are landmarks in their own right, immersed in the heart of the city's prestige and luxury. The London Hilton, with its commanding views of Hyde Park and proximity to Mayfair, is a symbol of opulence, while the Trafalgar St. James resonates with historical significance, nestled near the iconic Trafalgar Square. But the Livingstone's touch extends further. The Radisson Blue at Portman Square exemplifies modern luxury, a shining example of contemporary hospitality. But it is the Livingston's ownership of the legendary Cleverdon House in Berkshire that truly captures the essence of historical grandeur. Cleverdon is not merely a hotel, it is a storied icon, steeped in British history and wrapped in the cloak of the nation's aristocracy. The legacy of Cliveden stretches back centuries, its walls echoing the whispers of political intrigue and high society gatherings. From its inception by the second Duke of Buckingham in the 17th century, Cliveden has been a stage for the powerful and the influential. Its opulent rooms and sprawling gardens have hosted royalty, prime ministers and celebrities, each adding to its illustrious past. And more than just its historical significance, Cliveden's architecture is a visual feast a blend of Romanesque and Renaissance styles that stands as a symbol of the pinnacle of British craftsmanship. Its gardens, too, are a masterpiece, offering a tranquil escape into nature, meticulously sculpted to perfection. However, the house's influence extends into popular culture as well, having inspired numerous authors and filmmakers. It's been the setting for key moments in history, like the notorious Profumo affair, which rocked the British government in the 1960s. Furthermore, the Livingstone's savvy investment of £165 million in Whitbread, the powerhouse behind Premier Inn, and the acquisition of 47 Holiday Inn Express outlets demonstrate a hawk's eye for mainstream market dominance. This move isn't just about expansion. It's about deepening their influence across different segments of the hospitality industry, from luxury to budget-friendly options. Moreover, their holdings in Atlas Hotels and iconic luxury hotels showcase prized assets like Chewton Glen in the New Forest, a retreat that offers an escape into nature's embrace, blending luxury with the tranquility of the English countryside. These establishments are more experiences than simple properties, offering distinct flavours of British elegance and charm. And beyond the hospitality realm, the Livingstone's portfolio encompasses a range of residential properties, painting a picture of their diverse investment strategy. This array includes 55 Baker Street, Elizabeth House and 10 Bloomsbury Way, among others, cementing their presence across key locations in central London and beyond. But their investment acumen is not limited to bricks and mortar. The Livingstones have ventured into the digital sphere with a significant stake in Evolution Gaming, a Swedish online gambling powerhouse. This foray has proven incredibly lucrative, yielding a phenomenal 5,000% return. Yes, 5,000%, not £5,000, substantially adding to their financial clout. And their combined net worth, as of winter 2023, is on track to hit an awe-inspiring £7 billion. However, despite their tremendous success and influence in the property sector, the Livingstone brothers maintain a remarkably low profile. Often referred to as the most secretive billionaire siblings in London, they exemplify the ethos of silent movers and shakers in the high-stakes world of real estate. However, how did these secret scions of real estate legends first get their start? Let's roll back the clock and find out. Both sons of a dentist in Ealing, London, the Livingstone sons shared not just familial ties, but also an early education at St. Paul's School, one of the city's most prestigious private schools. Born in May 1962, Ian Livingstone's journey from the bustling streets of London to the hallowed halls of higher education was marked by academic rigour and precision. A student of City University London, he pursued optometry, emerging in 1984 as a qualified optometrist. His academic achievements set the stage for what would become a flourishing career in the optical retail sector. 
By 1990, Ian had ascended to the role of chairman and majority shareholder of the Optica Clulo Group. Under his leadership, the group expanded its reach to include 170 optician stores, marking a significant footprint in the industry. And Ian's personal life, too, reflects a blend of intellectual pursuits and familial warmth. He married Natalie, a journalist whose intellect and wit are as sharp as her Cambridge education. Together, they navigate the joys and challenges of raising three daughters, Grace, Alice and Elizabeth, each embarking on her own unique journey. And Richard Livingstone's story, while parallel in its beginnings, takes a different turn. Born in November 1964, as previously mentioned, he shared the same educational roots as his brother at St. Paul's School. His career trajectory, however, led him to the world of property and surveying. Richard honed his skills as a chartered surveyor, a profession demanding a keen eye for detail and precision, skills undoubtedly nurtured during his formative years, and his time at Richard Ellis in the 80s spoke to his growing expertise in the field. But Richard's personal life has seen its share of highs and lows. In 1997, he married Claire Burns, daughter of John Burns of the Derwent London Property Group, a union that brought together two families with deep roots in the property sector, However, their paths eventually diverged, leading to their divorce. After their initial jaunts in business, the Livingston brothers, united by blood and ambition, ventured into property development, marking a significant shift in their professional lives. Their acquisition of the David Clulo Optician's chain in 1992 was just the beginning, before they sold the chain in 2011, signaling a full transition to property development. Interestingly, many of their early projects were underpinned by financial support from Jacob Rothschild's merchant bank, Dornay Day, a partnership that speaks to the brothers' knack for forging strategic alliances. Therefore, the Shakespearean drama of London real estate between the Reuben and Livingston brothers is a modern-day epic. The Reuben brothers' journey from modest beginnings to the pinnacle of London's property market is a striking illustration of strategic acumen and entrepreneurial spirit, and, on the other side, the Livingston brothers, equally ambitious and twice as discreet, have crafted a diverse empire, encompassing everything from iconic hotels to innovative commercial spaces. Imagine for a moment that you and a sibling are at the helm of a real estate and media empire, holding the reins of a multi-billion dollar fortune. What avenues would you explore with such unfathomable wealth at your disposal? Perhaps you'd invest in groundbreaking philanthropic ventures like the Rockefeller family, or maybe you'd indulge in the ultimate luxuries that only the richest can afford, from owning private jets to collecting exotic art pieces, just like the Dukes of Norfolk. Indeed, the possibilities are as vast as the wealth itself, stretching the limits of imagination and ambition. However, if your surname happens to be Barclay, you and your next of kin's approach to this immense wealth diverges significantly from conventional paths. Certainly, for the Barclay brothers, their billions weren't just a ticket to luxury and philanthropy. They became the means to an unparalleled experiment in sovereignty and power. Taking over a small island, they transformed it into their own personal dominion, altering its century-old laws and essentially creating a private political playground, leveraging their fortune to help grow their coffers even further, much to the chagrin of the UK. These bold brethren orchestrated a scenario few could conceive, let alone execute. In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll dive into the fascinating journey of the Barclay brothers, exploring how they took a multi-billion dollar fortune and ran with it to take over an island, reshaping reality to fit their vision. In the high-octane world of global business, Sir David and Sir Frederick Barclay are the magicians pulling rabbits out of hats, with a fortune to the tune of 3.9 billion US dollars to prove it. And their empire, built on the pillars of media, retail and real estate, speaks to their knack for spotting golden opportunities where others see dead ends, and diving into their corporate collection, you'll find it's no ordinary lineup. First up, Elliman Lines, once a commanding force in the shipping world, navigating the high seas with its cargo and shipping services. It's like the seasoned captain of the fleet, steering through international waters with the ease of a seasoned sea dog. Then there's Littlewoods, a retail giant with a history as rich as any treasure chest. 
From catalogue sales to high street stores, Littlewoods has clothed and catered to generations of Brits, making it a household name. Yodel steps onto the scene as the courier extraordinaire, darting across the UK with parcels and packages. And lastly, the Telegraph Media Group, wielding the mighty pen, or should we say keyboard, as its sword, brings news, commentary and insights to a thirsty audience. In an age of information, TMG is like the town crier and the printing press rolled into one, delivering the word to the nation's doorsteps and screens. Together, these companies form a constellation of commercial success, each star shining brightly in its corner of the Barclay universe. Furthermore, the Barclay Brothers saga could easily be a modern-day Dickens tale, charting their rise from the humble beginnings in the accounts department of the General Electric Company to the zenith of capitalist success. Their trophy case of acquisitions shines brightly with the Ritz Hotel in London, a purchase that epitomized their fearless and triumphant strategy. This opulent haven, alongside their impressive collection of prime real estate yachts and jets, underscores their appetite for the lavish lifestyle. And a notable emblem of their success was the Lady Beatrice, a luxury yacht that floated as a palace on the sea, reflecting the grandeur the Barclay brothers have come to embody. Named after their mother, this 60-metre testament to luxury, complete with classic art and Baroque furniture, required a crew of 17 and an annual upkeep of $3 million, pocket change for the Barclays. But their adventures weren't confined to the seas. The skies also bore witness to their luxury with a Sikorsky S-76A helicopter, symbolizing their penchant for high-end, efficient travel. However, their journey was not without its share of turbulence. The acquisition of Breku, a tiny island neighboring Sark, thrust them into the spotlight, igniting controversies and legal skirmishes that tested Sark's age-old feudal laws to their limits. You see, Sark is a small island in the Channel Islands, known for its unique blend of breathtaking scenery and ancient feudal laws, making it a place where modernity and tradition intertwine. Yet this picturesque setting became the backdrop for the intriguing saga of the Barclay Brothers whose penchant for luxury and ambitious endeavors extended beyond the realms of the sea and sky. Thus, the narrative of the Barclay brothers is a complex weave of ambition, legal battles and luxury, marked by their status as tax exiles and controversies surrounding the tax arrangements of properties like the Ritz Hotel. Yet, as the story unfolded, it led to a pivotal moment that would shock both admirers and critics alike. In a dramatic turn of events, Facing mounting pressure and scrutiny, the Barclays made a controversial decision to evade authorities, taking their multi-billion pound empire into uncharted territories. What drove them to such lengths and what would be the consequences of their bold escape? In the heart of West London, Hammersmith to be precise, were born David and Frederick Barclay on the 27th of October, 1934. Soon the twins, identical in appearance but unique in ambition, would grow to be luminaries in the realm of British entrepreneurship. Now, their journey began under the shadow of loss with their father, Frederick Hugh Barclay, a travelling salesman passing away when the boys were just on the cusp of adolescence at 12. Then, their mother, Beatrice Cecilia Taylor, took the helm of the family ship, steering her eight children through the choppy waters of post-World War II Britain. You see, Hammersmith, at this time, was itself licking its wounds from the war's bombings, with the Barclay family and their neighbours living in a tapestry of shared spaces and makeshift accommodations. Amidst this backdrop of recovery and reconstruction, the Barclays saga took its first turn. Leaving school at the tender age of 16, they entered the corporate world through the doors of the General Electric Company. Consequently, working in the accounts department during the early 1950s, offered them a front row seat to the era's business machinations, a time when the country was rebooting its economy and London was buzzing with the electric current of rejuvenation. However, it wasn't long before the twins decided that the corporate ladder was too constricting for their broader ambitions. With a dash of audacity, they traded their calculators and ledgers for paintbrushes and wallpaper, embarking on a venture into painting and decorating. This pivot from the structured path of employment to the unpredictable waters of entrepreneurship 
was the real beginning of their ascent. Indeed, it wasn't just a career change, it was the dawn of the Barclay Brothers' legacy, marking their transition from ordinary employees to architects of their own destiny. Soon, David and Frederick Barclay took their entrepreneurial spirits to the retail world, opening Candy Corner, a tobacconist and confectioner's shop on the outskirts of Kensington. And managing such a venture at that time meant navigating the complexities of a society where smoking was widely accepted and sweet treats were in high demand, blending the traditional with the pleasure of the era. Yet, despite their best efforts, the Barclay brothers encountered significant challenges. By November 1960, a disagreement with their landlord led to both Frederick and his brother Douglas being declared bankrupt. However, this hurdle did nothing to dampen their resolve. And during this period, David Barclay's personal life flourished as he married Zoe Newton, a ballet dancer turned model, celebrated for her appearances in Dairy Council advertisements. Frederick, on the other hand, delved into the world of painting and decorating and took a pioneering approach to transforming boarding houses into hotels. Next, the 1960s saw the Barclays founding Hillgate Estate Agents, embarking on a venture that positioned David at the helm as director with his wife, Zoe, supporting as co-director. By 1968, the leadership baton had passed to Frederick, who spearheaded the family enterprises. The brothers' ventures received a significant boost with substantial loans from the Crown agents, facilitating their acquisition of guest plan hotels and the prestigious Londonderry House Hotel on Park Lane in 1970. As the decade progressed, the Barclays' business empire expanded to include breweries, casinos, and significant forays into property development. And their acquisition of the Howard Hotel in 1975, overlooking the Thames, underscored their burgeoning influence in the hospitality sector. This period also saw Frederick marrying Hiroko Asada, further enriching the Barclay family's social landscape. The Barclays' aggressive expansion strategies continued unabated into the 80s, culminating in the acquisition of Elliman, a prominent brewing and shipping group, for £45 million in 1983. And this strategic investment proved fruitful as they later divested its brewing division for £240 million, more than a 4x return on investment. Subsequently, the profits from these ventures were strategically reinvested into various ambitious projects, including the acquisition of the iconic Ritz Hotel in 1995. This move was not just a transaction, it was an emblem of their ascension to the zenith of luxury and a bold declaration of their prowess in the hospitality industry. You see, the Ritz, with its illustrious history and association with unparalleled elegance, became a jewel in their crown, highlighting the Barclays' ability to identify and seize opportunities that resonated not just financially, but culturally and socially. And beyond the shores of the United Kingdom, the Barclays extended their influence into the international arena, making significant investments in Gotthas Larsen, a Bermuda-based shipping conglomerate, and the Automotive Financial Group, a global motor retail chain. These ventures further solidified their status as visionaries with a keen eye for diversification and global market dynamics. However, with great power comes great responsibility. And soon the immense influence the Barclay brothers wielded would lead to a testing of their ability to keep on the clear and moral course throughout the gaining of unfathomable wealth. As they embarked on their extraordinary spree of real estate triumphs, the Barclay brothers laid claim to the tenement of Breco in 1993. This modest sibling to the island of Sark, nestled within the Channel Islands, caught their eye not just for its scenic allure, but also for its fiscal advantages and the chance to forge a significant footprint within a distinctive self-regulated domain. Opting to settle there, the Barclays were drawn by the island's favourable tax status and the opportunity to influence a locale, boasting a storied and largely unaltered constitution that traces back centuries. And their presence on Breku was soon marked by the erection of a mock Gothic castle, a grand design by Quinlan Terry featuring formidable granite walls stretching 100 feet into the sky, complete with battlements, dual swimming pools, and even a helipad for their aerial comings and goings. However, the Barclays' tenure on Breco 
has not been without its controversies, primarily legal skirmishes with Sark's governance. Disputes ranged from infractions of Sark's motor vehicle prohibitions to aspirations for Breco's political secession, inspired by historical assertions that the island wasn't inherently tied to Sark's feudal grip. A particularly striking chapter in their island saga involved appealing to the European Court of Human Rights, challenging Sark's inheritance laws favoring primogeniture. Their legal battle aimed to democratize their estate's succession, ultimately compelling Sark's legislature to revise its inheritance statutes, thus allowing a state division among any children, not just the eldest son. The Barclay brothers' arrival and subsequent actions on Sark and Breku also catalyzed significant socio-political change, culminating in the dissolution of Sark's 443-year-old feudal system and ushering in the island's first democratic elections in 2008. And their acquisition spree, which captured nearly a quarter of the island's real estate and a swath of pivotal businesses, including the prime hospitality establishments, the sole construction entity, the exclusive estate agency, and a major stretch of the commercial artery prompted a mixture of awe and apprehension. This economic stranglehold raised eyebrows not just among the islanders, but also within the corridors of UK governance, stirring debates over the potential for an imbalanced sway over Sark's future direction. You see, the Barclays' blueprint for the island envisioned a blend of the contemporary with the quaint charm of Sark, proposing infrastructure marvels like a funicular railway and a state-of-the-art helipad. However, these ambitions collided with the island's cherished traditions and its stringent codes, notably the blanket ban on aerial vehicles. The post-electoral shuttering of their operations in 2008, leading to a widespread job crisis, was perceived by many as a maneuver steeped in coercion, casting the brothers in a rather tyrannical light. The ensuing years have woven a complex narrative of legal skirmishes and vocal opposition to the Barclays' endeavours, embodying the friction between progress and preservation. The UK government, under the mantle of overseeing governance in its crown dependencies, found itself in a delicate balancing act, aiming to thwart any monopolistic dominance that could undermine Sark's democratic fabric. Contrary to the Barclays' narrative of philanthropic investment driven by an affinity for Sark and a quest for modernization, their actions have frequently been interpreted through a lens of strategic self-interest aimed at moulding Sark's socio-economic contours to their benefit. This ongoing saga, rich in both its economic implications and its impact on the communal ethos, continues to fuel discussions and concerns among Sark's populace and observers alike. Pondering the lasting legacy of the Barclays' tenure on the island's socio-cultural history. And yet, the money printer kept ticking during these controversies, and soon, the Barclay brothers would increase their wallet sizes and bank balances even more. The acquisition of the Telegraph Group in 2004 by Sir David and Sir Frederick Barclay was a landmark moment in the UK's media landscape, commanding a £665 million price tag. This strategic move, finalised amidst a fiercely contested legal and bidding war, underscored the Barclays' resolve to incorporate one of Britain's most venerable newspapers into their expansive media empire. Yet the sales backdrop was fraught with the financial and legal woes of the previous owner, Conrad Black. His efforts to thwart the transaction ultimately fell short against the Barclays' assertive bid, and this acquisition expanded their holdings to include the Daily Telegraph, the Sunday Telegraph, and the Spectator magazine complementing their existing media interests in the Scotsman and the business. Far from a mere business manoeuvre, this acquisition embodied the Barclays' long-standing ambition to fortify their presence within the media sphere. However, this chapter also prefaced a series of even more future controversies and familial discord that would test the fabric of the Barclays' empire. At the heart of these challenges, was a succession dispute that entangled Sir David's sons, Aidan and Howard Barclay, and their uncle, Sir Frederick Barclay. This internal strife, spanning two decades, centred around the control and stewardship of key family assets, including the Telegraph Group and the Ritz Hotel. The dispute 
escalated into public and acrimonious legal battles, expanded by allegations of secret recordings and contentious negotiations over the Ritz's sale. The familial rift was starkly illuminated in February 2020 when revelations emerged of covert surveillance at the Ritz Hotel, capturing Sir Frederick Barclay in private discussions about the hotel's sale. This saga culminated in the sale of the Ritz to Qatari businessman Abdul Hadi Mana Al Hajri in April 2020, a transaction mired in controversy and dissent within the Barclay family. This ordeal, which became particularly pronounced following Sir David Barclay's passing in January 2021, laid bare the intricate challenges of succession within a family owned conglomerate. The unfolding drama highlighted the tension between preserving family unity and managing a vast and diversified business empire, spotlighting the precarious balance between generational dynamics and the stewardship of a multifaceted corporate legacy. When you stroll through the cobblestone streets of West London, you're immediately enveloped in a world of sumptuous wealth and wallet-emptying luxury. Majestic townhouses stand tall, seemingly watching over avenues adorned with exotic cars and bespoke boutiques. Tourists and locals alike revel in the shadow of iconic landmarks, beckoning for a rendezvous under their gilded entrances. And yet this region, synonymous with timeless sophistication, velvet rope exclusivity, and a certain elegant flair, wasn't always the Instagram highlight reel of affluence you see today. Before the transformative touch of the old money aristocratic family we'll discuss here today, areas like Chelsea and Knightsbridge were far removed from the well-heeled paradises they are now. They were vast stretches of spotty farmland, modest cottages, and the far cry of livestock echoing in the distance. Indeed, they were a stark contrast to the cosmopolitan wonderlands of West London that have become playgrounds for the world's elite. Thus, who were the architects of this grand transformation, turning barren, underdeveloped lands into a real estate empire and setting the gold standard for opulence in our lovely capital? In today's video, we'll answer that and so much more as we give you the good, the bad and the luxury of the Cadogan family, a lineage that shaped not just the geography but the very architectural essence of some of London's most iconic old money districts. The origins of the Cadogan mega-empire we know today begin in the mist-shrouded crags of Ireland in the year 1671. Here, history would see the birth of William Cadogan, a figure shaped for a destiny replete with intrigues and complexities. Born to Henry Cadogan, a barrister, the Cadogan paternal line had a background that wasn't limited to the courtroom. Henry's lineage, in fact, was tinged with the gunpowder and steel of the English Civil War. His father, William's grandfather, had worn the no-nonsense attire of Oliver Cromwell's New Model Army, an outfit that didn't just change the rules of engagement in Britain, it rewrote them entirely. And we mustn't forget the first matriarch of the Cadogan family, Bridget Waller, William's mother. Her own father, Sir Hardress Waller, had executed a different kind of verdict, one that led to the beheading of King Charles I and shook the very thrones of England. Thus, in a parallel vein to one of the other mighty old money real estate families of London we've discussed on this channel, the Groveners, who boast a military lineage reaching back to William the Conqueror, the Cadogans too had war in their blood. The key distinction, however, was the specific chapter in which the Cadogans had penned their military involvements, the tumultuous, landscape-altering English Civil War. Thus, it was as if William Cadogan, from his first breath as the leader in a centuries-long dynasty of familial power, was destined for grand manoeuvres. As the wheel of time turned, the Cadogan name would be etched into an unexpected sector of society, real estate. Vast expanses of prime West London property would eventually come under their purview, a monumental shift from the families of military and political machinations, yet a continuation of a legacy of influence and grand strategy. You see, in the societal context of the 1600s and 1700s, land was more than dirt and grass. It was the currency of power. But William Cadogan and his contemporaries didn't merely hoard patches of earth. Their properties extended to County Limerick in Ireland, positioning them as strategic entities in the Irish theatre, although they were of primarily Welsh heritage. Destined for the world of law, young William found himself at Westminster School under the scrutinising eyes of Richard Busby. Yet fate had a penchant for irony, and the glorious revolution of 1688 scrambled all pre-existing plans. William of Orange dethroned James II, 
slicing Ireland into fiercely divided factions. The Cadogans, staunch Protestants that they were, threw in their lot with William of Orange. They didn't merely offer support, they amplified the ranks of the Army of the North. William Cadogan enlisted not as a common soldier but as a cornet of dragoons, a position reserved for the audacious. He was, after all, a Cadogan, and Cadogans don't just participate, they revolutionize. Furthermore, if ambition were currency, William was a tycoon. He gravitated toward the Duke of Marlborough, a maestro of politics and strategy. They were not merely allies but co-authors of a narrative that would culminate in William entering politics in 1705. Holding his post in the Houses of Commons until 1716, his tenacity was formally acknowledged. He ascended to the peerage, becoming Baron Cadogan, his deeds and alliances with figures like Marlborough cementing this honour. Thus history transforming William to Baron Cadogan wasn't merely an upgrade, it was a metamorphosis. Years of cunning and daring crystallised into a title that had its own gravity in the halls of British power. Therefore the Cadogan name was not only inked into the ledgers of British elite, but was poised to dominate the affluent enclaves of West London. But that transition, viewers, was only the prologue. Ahead lay a landscape of stone and steel, ripe for a new kind of conquest. Now, as the 18th century began, the Cadogan dynasty was on an unstoppable trajectory, each strategic decision marking another square on a chessboard of affluence and influence. A member of the family's marriage with Elizabeth Sloane in 1717 was thus more than a mere blending of two blue-blooded families. It was a quantum leap, a tectonic shift in the Cadogan family's destiny. You see, Elizabeth was not just the daughter of Hans Sloane, a man who served as physician to the British royals and was a cornerstone of the royal society. She was a passport to an empire of wealth. Indeed, Sir Hans Sloane's collection of items eventually formed the foundation of the British Museum, the British Library and the Natural History Museum in London. And his 166 acres of prime Chelsea land were nothing less than a wellspring of future opportunities. For example, a pivotal moment would come in 1777, courtesy of Charles Sloane Cadogan, the first Earl Cadogan. With the kind of audacity reserved for men of his ilk, he gave birth to Hans Town, London's first new town, a revolutionary residential district designed with panache. Situated on the fringe of Chelsea, it was more than just property, it was a tantalizing hint of the urban sprawl that would soon sweep the area. Named after Hans Sloane himself, it epitomized the family's calculated ambition and keen sense of urban planning. See, by the 1800s, the West London scenery was ripe for transformation. Chelsea and Belgravia turned into magnets of sophistication, drawing in an eclectic blend of individuals, from writers wielding quills like sabres to industrialists crafting empires. The metamorphosis found its zenith in the 1830s and 1840s, catalyzed by particular infrastructure milestones. In 1836, the debut of the London and Southampton Railway added a touch of expedience, transforming the districts into commuter heavens overnight. A less glamorous but crucial endeavour saw Chelsea and Belgravia equipped with state-of-the-art sewage systems by the 1850s. A civil engineering marvel of its day, it elevated the public health standards, rendering the locales all the more alluring. The capital and wealth allocation flowed with a velocity that could rival the River Thames, manifesting in squares and houses of sheer opulence. George Basavi's Belgrave Square in 1826 was such an estate swiftly becoming London's piece de resistance of residential grandeur. Eaton Square, completed in 1855, wasn't far behind. It added another layer of prestige to Belgravia, swiftly becoming an aristocratic playground frequented by the likes of diplomats and the moneyed elite. Then, as if punctuating an already eloquent sentence, the 1880s saw the fifth Earl Cadogan bring forth Pont Street Dutch, an architectural style redolent of flair and grandiosity it coloured Chelsea and Belgravia with an aesthetic as distinctive as a Cadogan family crest. But stagnation is not a term found in the Cadogan lexicon, and their emerald fingerprints can also be found on West London's landscape and horticulture. Particularly in Belgravia, the family's influence is evident in the hallowed grounds of Cadogan Place Gardens, a green oasis, a veritable Eden, nestled amidst the stony opulence of its environs. Laid out meticulously, these gardens serve not merely as recreational spaces, but as lush havens for urban fauna. 
It's more than just a garden. It's a manifestation of this family's ethos of excellence, mirrored by the adjacent equally exquisite townhouses. Whether offering spots for leisure, areas for flora and fauna to thrive, or even allotments that encouraged local cultivation, these spaces became an integral part of the city's evolving lifestyle, a lifestyle that the Cadogans were pivotal in defining. Now, in the early 20th century, the Cadogan found themselves at a historical intersection. Chelsea was undergoing a metamorphosis, morphing from a semi-rural idol into a vibrant cosmopolitan district. This was a period of electric change. Artisans and bohemians flooded the borough, painting its streets with hues of creativity. Outside the immediate precincts of Hans Town, the Cadogan touch was omnipresent. Draycott Place began to resemble a stage set for elegance, boasting row houses and small mansions adorned in high white stuccoed facades and red brick exteriors. Cadogan Terrace emerged as an idyllic enclave, a suburban dream encapsulated within London's pulsing heart, complete with lush gardens nestled between residential jewels. King's Road, once a nondescript avenue, burgeoned into a hub of commercial allure, especially after the Second World War. It morphed into a byword for chic, home to boutiques, cafes, and the vibrant spirit of the swinging 60s. In Belgravia, Cadogan Place evolved into a magnet for opulence, a display of architectural prowess featuring Neo-Georgian and Victorian styles. Sloan Square, once a simple square, transformed into a veritable epicenter of commerce and culture, replete with department stores and venues like the Royal Court Theatre. The adjacent streets to the east of Sloan Street danced to a similar tune, becoming boulevards of style and status, graced by art galleries and international embassies. It was as if the Cadogans were artists and their real estate holdings a canvas, upon which they painted a vivid portrait of what West London could be, more than just residential spaces, but crucibles of culture, commerce and high society. Each building, each garden and each commercial venture stood as a marker of their far-reaching influence. And these days the name Cadogan is synonymous with affluence and real estate might. The reigning patriarch, Edward Cadogan, 9th Earl Cadogan, inherited his title in the year 2023. This transition of nobility came on the heels of his father, Charles Cadogan's departure from the earthly stage. The year was 1966 when Edward made his debut in the world, born to Charles and the graceful Lady Philippa Wallop. Before immersing himself in the family's vast holdings, Edward donned the garb of a military man, an officer of the Royal Air Force, where his performance was nothing short of stellar. Upon switching from fatigues to boardroom suits in 2012, Edward assumed the chairmanship of the Cadogan Group. This monolithic entity reigned over a colossal 90 acres of London's choicest real estate, a portfolio boasting a breathtaking valuation of £5.1 billion, or roughly $6.4 billion, as of 2022. And the younger generation of the Cadogans is far from mundane either. Among them is Edward's daughter, also named Philippa, an interior designer and a viral socialite of significant repute in both media and artistic domains. In 2021, Philippa announced her engagement to fellow aristocratic heir Christian von Kelsen, also born in the year 1992. Specifically, Christian is the offspring of Mr. Hans von Chelsing and his wife, Virginia Anne Mackenzie, herself a descendant of the Mackenzie Baronets, a lineage with roots that date back to the 17th century, dovetailing perfectly with Philippa's own esteemed heritage. And Christian himself has a genealogy that could rival a history book. He comes from a line that includes the Rawlinson, Kirkpatrick and Seymour Baronets, each a name etched into the annals of British nobility. Further amplifying the historical weight, he counts among his ancestors the Dukes of Somerset, a line that can trace its grandeur back to the Plantagenet era. Yet, as the spotlight beams on Philippa, it's crucial not to overlook another intriguing figure, Charles William Llewellyn Cadogan, born on the 2nd of October 1998. For the teenage Charles, Philippa's younger brother, growing up as a Generation Z aristocrat, must be nothing short of a riveting juxtaposition of eras. Imagine, if you will, the curious blend of 21st century sensibilities with a heritage that dates back centuries. While other young adults might immerse themselves in the digital age, dabbling in social media and online gaming, Charles must often straddle a world where ancient tapestries share room space with cutting-edge technology. Indeed, Charles briefly grazed media headlines in 2018 thanks to a spirited jaunt that found him driving his grey BMW 
at a blistering 71 miles per hour in a 50 mile per hour zone. The young Cadogan explained that the anticipation of nearing the family's sprawling 2,800 acre Scottish estate, Snago Estate, caused him to momentarily disregard the law. The incident led to a £300 fine and the imposition of four points on his driving license. Although the exact figure of Charles's current personal net worth remains veiled in discretion, there's no questioning the immense fortune to which he is heir. This is a sum that is calculated not merely in billions of pounds, approximately seven billion to be more precise, but in the immeasurable currency of social prestige and historic stature. Thus, from their humble origins in Wales to their eventual settlement in Ireland and further afield to Albion, the saga of the Cadogan Earls unfurls like a chronicle, tinged with both valour and shrewd manoeuvring. Their history winds its way through the turbulent English Civil War, a period where loyalties were tested and fates sealed. The family emerged not broken but tempered, gaining both military distinction and social prominence. Fast forward to more recent times, and one finds the Cadogans not as mere survivors, but as potentates of an empire, landowners in the very epicentre of London's opulence. As you might have heard, or seen with your very own eyes as you take your afternoon strolls along the Thames, a seismic shift is rumbling through London's illustrious centres of financial power and political intrigue. Long ensconced as the playground of Britain's old money aristocracy, this enclave of enduring privilege is being infiltrated by an avant-garde of global wealth. In our 21st century, the old guard, families with historic ties to fertile lands and political dynasties, finds itself jostling for room with a rising wave of foreign financiers. You see, the landscape is no longer solely coloured by long-standing British families like the Groveners and Cadogans, but by new players with contrasting cultures and vastly different recipes for the direction of the capital of the United Kingdom. Long-held bastions of hereditary affluence are witnessing the influx of a new cadre of economic titans, moguls from Moscow and magnates from the Middle East. And they're not waiting for an invitation. They're knocking down doors and making their presence felt, leaving the old elites contemplating their place in a rapidly evolving paradigm. How did this all happen so quickly? What led the British old money crowd to loosen their grip on power in just a few short decades? In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll answer those questions and more as we describe why old money United Kingdom families sold London to global oligarchs. In the labyrinthine financial corridors of London's historic elite, the underpinnings are as nuanced as they are enduring, intimately knit with the political and economic pulse of the city. It's a terrain marked by colossal inheritances spanning multiple generations, underscored by financial behemoths that comprise a diverse range of assets, from stately lands to equities and international pursuits. But pivot your gaze toward emerging power centers like Moscow or the Middle East, and a different narrative emerges. Unlike London's pedigreed aristocracy, which draws its affluence largely from hereditary opulence and familial legacies, the nouveau riche of these regions have a genesis rooted in contemporary wealth gained by a shrewd and no-holds-barred entrepreneurial spirit. Be it the windfalls of oil, the dynamism of technology, or the levers of political affinity, their ascendance is more immediately economic, less marinated in the intricate choreography of societal and governance histories that have shaped London's old money hierarchy. For instance, among London's wealthiest individuals, you'll find people like Alisha Usmanov from Russia, reportedly worth more than 12 billion pounds, who made his fortune in metals and mining, or Egyptian multi-billionaire Nassif Sawiris, known for his investments in construction and chemicals. And this distinction between the London old guard and the new money players isn't merely academic, it extends into how these elites maneuver their influence. London's aristocracy wields significant financial power which they channel into an ecosystem of philanthropic foundations and direct political influence. Their strategy serves two purposes, preserving their enormous wealth and carefully shaping their social and political standing. It's not just about skyline altering real estate, their imprints are indelibly etched into London's basic frameworks, from public utilities to laws and popular opinion. Additionally, scions of London aristocracy, families like the Grosvenor and the Cadogan, have been arbiters in the political landscape, historically ensconced in the House of Lords and adept at lobbying. Beyond this, 
they've been visionaries of urban landscapes. Their sprawling real estate portfolios in prime territories like Mayfair and Belgravia serving not just as centers of influence, but as a catalyst for the city's very design. In the cosmopolitan tableau of New London, Russian oligarchs and Middle Eastern moguls are carving out their own spheres of influence with striking speed. Unlike the city's pedigreed elite, whose influence has evolved over centuries within the corridors of governance, these newcomers are fast-tracking their way into political prominence. Their currency, strategic investments in pivotal sectors and hefty political contributions. While London's established elite have historically curated the city with a long view stewardship, this new ilk often treats London as another portfolio asset, calibrated for immediate dividends. The shift is more than superficial. It speaks to a profound metamorphosis in the philosophies guiding the city's growth and governance. With the byproduct of this tectonic shift, often meaning a dilution of old money strongholds. Long-standing families like the Groveners and Cadogans are finding their enclave borders increasingly porous. The drivers of this change are twofold. Firstly, London's marquee real estate has become a global magnet for capital, touted as both a secure and glamorous investment. Secondly, the financial muscle of some of these heritage families is waning, partly due to shifting tax landscapes and the exorbitant costs of estate upkeep. Foreign capital not only elevates property values, but also infuses much-needed liquidity. The catch? The guardians of London's traditional epicenters must now mingle with a new cadre of global titans who bring their own set of cultural and fiscal mores. Enter the city of London, colloquially known as the Square Mile. A nexus for global commerce and banking, its relationship with London's aristocratic families is fascinatingly complex. These families have often been the invisible hand, owning the land that fueled the city's financial engines. Their fortunes were inextricably tied to the rise and fall of the city's economic vitality. Yet the relationship was far from one-dimensional. The city's prosperity indirectly fattened the coffers of these families, while their land and capital allowed the city to proliferate. They were both puppeteers and beneficiaries in London's intricate socio-economic performance holding sway in ways that cannot be easily erased. As we look ahead, the question looms, in this evolving landscape, will the newcomers find a way to weave their own legacy as seamlessly into London's complex tapestry? No, it won't be a simple insertion. It is a reconfiguration of the city's very DNA, marking a new epoch in our capital's history. Now in a financial dynamic characterized by shifting tides, London's storied old money families have found themselves navigating a relentless sea of economic and political challenges throughout the 20th century. These pressures have siphoned off their traditional financial heft and political clout, while simultaneously creating a vacuum for international capital to flood in. The Crucible, a series of pivotal moments that changed the very foundation of their wealth. The repercussions of World War I served as an initial reckoning. The conflict's economic drain led many blue-blooded families to part with prized assets, from expansive estates to cherished art collections, just to uphold their lifestyle. The 1911 Parliament Act then chipped away at their political leverage, curbing the influence of the House of Lords, a realm where many had historical seats. But perhaps the most transformative change lay in the realm of finance. With the outbreak of World War I, the Bank of England abandoned the gold standard a bulwark of predictability for those with deep pockets. The move to fiat currency led to a cascade of ramifications. First off, the ballooning money supply drove inflation, eroding the real value of old money assets like bonds and even depreciating the worth of their grand estates. Secondly, the shift injected a new dose of volatility into the economic environment. The pound, now untethered from gold, became more susceptible to market whims and policy missteps. These families, long accustomed to investing in stable assets, found themselves on shaky ground. The new currency landscape was directly tied to government stability and economic vitality, rendering their wealth more vulnerable to economic shocks. Third, the financial metamorphosis heralded a structural economic shift. Traditional wellsprings of affluence, like land and agriculture, began to wane in profitability. On the other hand, Emerging sectors like manufacturing and services rose to prominence. The aristocracy, slow to pivot, saw their economic might diminish. Lastly, 
the advent of a more flexible monetary policy, including the Bank of England's newfound ability to set interest rates, introduced another layer of complexity for these families. No longer could they count on a predictable economic landscape. They had to adapt to more levers being pulled in the management of their wealth. But the trials didn't end there. World War II further strained resources, compelling even more families to surrender ancestral lands. Then came post-war policies that turned the screws on hereditary wealth, exorbitant inheritance taxes, and the Labour government's commitment to a welfare state. So here we stand, amidst a transformed economic and political topography. While the heritage of old money families remains an ineradicable part of London's identity, the question that looms large is, can they adapt fast enough to maintain their historical role in this ever-evolving landscape? Now, in the autumnal haze of 1986, London's financial heartbeat underwent an extraordinary change. This transformation, known as the Big Bang, was a suite of deregulatory reforms championed by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. The changes tore down barriers to entry in financial services, introduced computerized trading, and magnetized foreign capital toward the city's bustling trading floors. While this flurry of change created new empires of affluence, it left the British old money families grappling with an evolving landscape that seemed increasingly inhospitable to their traditional influence. The symbolic moment came when Prince Al-Walid bin Talal acquired a significant stake in the Savoy Hotel in 1988. Iconic British institutions were suddenly becoming the acquisitions of wealthy foreign investors. A sensation of vulnerability permeated the walls of grand manors and estates, long considered inviolable sanctuaries. These large estates became burdensome to maintain financially, particularly during the era of rising costs that characterized the late 80s. Reluctantly, many British elite families converted their ancestral homes into public attractions or commercial enterprises. Each entry ticket sold and each business transaction conducted eroded centuries of family legacy. And still, by the conclusion of the 1980s, many families remained in precarious financial straits. But if the 80s were rocky, the 90s were tumultuous. The decade opened with a recession, pulling down property values and putting a financial stranglehold on old money families. The infamous Black Wednesday in 1992 was a further blow. The UK's exit from the European exchange rate mechanism precipitated a devaluation of the British pound, wreaking havoc on long-term investments. The financial arena continued to evolve, Hedge funds and private equity firms emerged as new conduits for investment, diverting resources from traditional asset pools. Tony Blair's ascension in 1997 added salt to the wound. His Labour government's tax policies, especially those targeting capital gains and inheritance, compelled further liquidation of cherished family assets. As the millennium approached, the old money families of Britain found themselves at a crossroads in a substantially altered financial landscape. The late 1990s and early 2000s saw London wrestling with an existential conundrum as the British aristocracy's influence waned in the face of a new wave of global wealth. High-profile Russian oligarchs, such as Roman Abramovich, began claiming stakes in prized London assets. The acquisition of Chelsea Football Club in 2003 by Abramovich was a clear demarcation announcing that London's economic and cultural stage was now open to the global elite. Investment rationales were diverse. Sultan Ahmed bin Sulayem's purchase of P&O, a maritime and ports company, showcased strategic long-term planning. It was not just about buying assets, but about embedding oneself in global networks of power and influence. These investments, for players like Sulayem, were bridges to greater geopolitical leverage, crossing national boundaries in their reach. Other figures like Sheikh Hamad bin Jassim bin Jabir Al Thani adopted a different strategy, using London as a canvas for portfolio diversification. Purchases spanned from real estate to financial entities, a blend calculated to minimize risk while maximizing gains. The moves not only fortified their financial standings, but wove them into the complex fabric of the British economic landscape. But their influence stretched further than the real estate sector. Increasing foreign influence over London's economic trajectory sparked debates over British sovereignty and identity, elevating foreign wealth into a hot-button political issue. London's neighbourhoods too underwent dramatic alterations, 
Globalization uprooted family-owned shops and local pubs, making room for boutique stores and high-end residences. The alterations led to the displacement of long-term residents, changing the character of the city. Perhaps the most disquieting aspect was the looming question of how foreign wealth might be swaying local politics. There was a growing unease that policy decisions were being tailored to suit these newly influential inhabitants. The presence of international capital was no longer confined to the corporate sphere. It had seeped into the corridors of governmental power. As London's economic and ownership landscapes metamorphosed, so did its socio-political identity. The foreign billionaires, brandishing their financial influence like artists with brushes, were recolouring London's identity in intricate and subtle ways. Though London had always been a hub of global exchange, the new millennium introduced layers of complexity that left even seasoned analysts pondering the future of London's identity. The transformation marked not merely an alteration, but a profound questioning of what it meant for London to be British in this increasingly interconnected world.